Thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, organizing this uh, very nice conference. I've been uh, uh, attending many of the uh, uh, previous week's talks also very interesting and it's nice to connect up with the mathematical community, which in the past I haven't uh, had as good connections with. Um, you know, there wasn't as much uh, interest in these high dimensional spaces in the past uh, that among the mathematicians I knew, but uh, now we're getting, now it's uh, nice to see these connections. Um, so I wanna talk about very recent results. These are going to appear in a, a preprint that we just sort of finished last night. So it'll be posted sometime this week in the uh, archive. Um, so ground state phase diagram of the T, T prime J model, this is, one of the models for high temperature superconductivity. Um, it's uh, work done using DMRG. And so I'm gonna give an introduction to the models uh, used for studying high temperature superconductivity, and also a little bit about the DMRG methods. Uh, then I'll show our phase diagram, and we have uh, some uh, uh, phases that we people have seen before, and some new phases, which are very interesting. I'll show some of the details of those, talk about how the model compares with experiments and give some conclusions. Um, so <clears throat> Shang Tao is uh, my student. Uh, Doug is my uh, postdoc mentor and long-term collaborator. And uh, so those are, those are the ones involved in the most recent work. And uh, so we're talking about models of high DC. Here's a, a quick little picture of, of some of the models. Uh, basically we think of electrons hopping around on lattice, the electrons have spin. Um, you could have uh, in the Hubbard model, a doubly occupied site, but that's penalized by an energy U. Uh, the hopping matrix element T hops things around. In the TJ model, uh, we integrate out the doubly occupied sites. So those are no longer present in the Hilbert space. Uh, we just have the holes moving around. The removal of the doubly occupied space is has uh, introduced the parameter J, which causes antiferromagnetism and antiferromagnetic interaction between uh, nearest neighbor sites. Okay. Let's see if we can, here we go. Okay, so uh, really we're interested in um, a whole family of models. The, the, the sort of 2D Hubbard model is the most famous one. But um, if you go back to where these came from, uh, the cuprates, um, the high temperature superconductors, um, have in common a copper oxygen plane of atoms. Uh, here the greens are the coppers and the reds are oxygens. Um, and the, and um, the first approximation that one does is to think of only one active orbital per atom. Um, and uh, if you do that and you, uh, you know, use various uh, calculations such as density functional theory, you can get parameters to parameterize that model. And that's the three band uh, model because there's uh, three atoms per unit cell. Uh, you go to the one band Hubbard model by assuming that the electron, the, the oxygen uh, orbitals are, which are a little bit higher in energy are sort of like stepping stones mediating hopping between the coppers. And so you sort of integrate out the uh, uh, oxygens and you're just left with a square lattice. And that's the, the Hubbard model. And then the TJ model uh, takes the removal of states, uh, high energy states one step further by removing the doubly occupied sites on a copper, assuming that this repulsion U is large. Um, in a few notes on the, the, the cuprates, here's a sort of very schematic phase diagram and we'll see a more detailed one uh, later on, but uh, you have hole doping and electron doping, depending on whether you have more electrons or fewer electrons. Um, and uh, the hole dope site has, uh, is the one that's most interesting experimentally because it has more robust uh, higher temperature superconductivity. The uh, y-axis here is temperature. Uh, but there are also, there's also the electron dope side. It has a smaller, narrow, narrower superconducting region. Um, the pairing that we find always has a particular D-wave symmetry, which, we'll, uh, which you'll see pictures of uh, later on. Um, and um, another feature that's seen experimentally, it's taken a while to, to, to uh, see this uh, clearly in many materials, but stripes are, are seen in many materials and we'll see those. 
Um, okay, and so here is the uh, TJ model that we're going to look at uh, with its uh, antiferromagnetic interaction and uh, hopping, uh, which in the, the T prime is the uh, uh, next nearest neighbor diagonal hopping. Um, uh, and uh, then we, the parameter, the energy scale parameters is for the uh, near neighbor hopping T is set to one. Now, a lot of the uh, sort of cartoon level understanding of the physics of uh, this system is it's a competition between the antiferromagnetism and the hopping. Um, so the, the doping range, the number of holes is usually uh, quite a bit less than the number of uh, single spins. Um, the parameter for the exchange, the uh, antiferromagnetism is smaller. And um, so what happens is that there's a high energy for the holes to hop around. When they hop, they, they simply trade places with the spins next to them. And so if I take this particular configuration and I hop the hole two spaces to the right, what happens is it's messed up the antiferromagnetism. It shifted these two spins over to the left and it makes these uh, ferromagnetic uh, bonds that are shown in red, uh, which are high energy states. So there's sort of a frustration between these two terms in the Hamiltonian um, that's induced by the dynamics of the, uh, the hopping. Okay, so, so um, we, uh, let me say a little bit about the tensor network methods that we uh, can use for these uh, uh, two-dimensional systems. Um, so so the, the traditional DMRG method um, uh, has been used for 2D systems in the sense of you uh, can have a finite width or you can have a, a finite width uh, cylinder. In this, these calculations, these will all, all be on cylinders. And we map the 2D system onto a 1D system simply by tracing a path through the system. It's called a snake pattern. Um, now, the problem with this uh, method is that the uh, accuracy of the matrix product state approximation is governed by the entanglement when you cut the two sides of the system in two at sort of the, the multi-particle rank of the system. And that depends on the number of interactions that uh, connect the two sides of the system. Uh, and uh, so the, the number of interactions grows with the length and you get that turns into an exponentially large number of states that depends on the width, but it doesn't depend on the length. So um, you can only carry this so far, uh, but DMRG is so efficient that we can actually do a pretty good job with this. Um, later on, people uh, devised uh, projected entangled pair states, which are a much more natural representation because they encode the entanglement in uh, all the directions that the Hamiltonian has terms. And uh, so it can give a much more compact uh, uh, representation in terms of the, the size of the tensors that you need. Uh, but the algorithms, because they have loops the, uh, and, and more bonds, the algorithms are much more efficient. And so some of the uh, algorithms, at least early on, you know, were scaling sort of as uh, the, the bond dimension to the 12th power as opposed to in DMRG where it's Q. So if we look at the status of this now, both of these methods are extremely useful. They're roughly comparable. And we usually prefer to think of these methods as being complements uh, where uh, the, the nicest thing we can do is use both and uh, often uh, using some other types of methods like quantum Monte Carlo because all of the methods have some sort of um, weakness and some strengths. Okay, so uh, we started uh, looking at um, the TJ model as uh, an easier model to simulate with DMRG back in the uh, late 90s. And uh, so this is work, a uh, number of papers that I did with uh, Doug starting in 19, uh, well, this, this, the stripes were, were, I'm showing here was shown in 1998. So um, I quickly learned that uh, to get people, it's very important to visualize um, the results of the simulations and a usual line plot doesn't really do it. And so I learned to become a movie maker and to show the evolution of the, the DMRG calculations to show how the states evolve because you get a sense of how this works, not just from the final uh, variational minimum, but also how it got there. So this is a uh, 12 by eight uh, lattice with eight holes stuck in the center. 
and the diameters of the holes is proportional to the probability of the hole being there. And then the lengths of the spins are proportional to the uh, uh, expectation value of the spin operator on that site. And I start the movie and you can see the DMRG sweeping back and forth. So it, it uh, has two sites in the middle where the, the op optimization is done and that sweeps back and forth. And then we, we measure the local parameters uh, the local observables of this state as the system uh, uh, evolves. And as the energy is decreased, controlled by the bond dimension, the size of the matrices M here. Okay. And um, so what you can see is that, uh, so the, 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 oh, so one other thing about the plotting is that the green versus purple or blue uh, arrows are showing when there's a domain wall. So if an upspin up is on an even side, it would be one color versus an upspin on an odd side. And what you see is that even though we saw it started the system in this sort of unbiased clump of holes in the center, it naturally spread out and it formed these objects called stripes. And um, the stripes act as domain walls. You can see the uh, green domain forming versus the other two domains. And these lines here are just lines of high probability of holes. Uh, so in this system, there would be four holes uh, in this sort of this periodic boundary conditions in the vertical direction. So this is um, a, a ring. And uh, so they spontaneously form these uh, stripes. And then that is the stable configuration. And uh, uh, pause it. And um, yeah, you know, that's, that's what the, the system does. Um, so why would the system in sort of a cartoon uh, idea, how, why should it do that? Um, well, so, so I, I talked about how the hopping of the holes messes up the any ferromagnetic background. If you want to uh, reduce the effect of that, um, if you put two holes together and they hop together, um, it shifts the, the spins twice and um, you end up with no disruption of the antiferromagnetism. So that's a very simple idea of how the pairing can form. You can also get that for stripes. So if I have a uh, line of holes and I move them all to the right, and if the spins initially were in this domain wall form where there's sort of a shift from over the, the line of holes, then um, the, the whole line can, can sort of hop to the to the right, and it doesn't disrupt the antiferromagnetism either. Whereas if you didn't have the domain wall, it would it would mess it up as soon as it hopped. So this is this sort of simple cartoon does describe the two sorts of things that we we see quite often, which is pairing giving rise to superconductivity and to stripes. Okay, <clears throat> so a summary of um, this uh, work that we did uh, over more than a, a decade. Um, uh, this key unexpected feature we found, although it had been seen in, in hartree fock calculations, uh, but we found stripes in most of the phase diagram that make these robust antiferromagnetic domain walls. Um, the stripes are caused by the same competition between whole motion and local antiferromagnetic order that causes pairing. Um, the stripes and superconductivity tend to compete a bit, but they can also coexist. Um, and the other conclusion we, we had is that overall the pairing we saw seemed to be a bit weak. And the role of T prime, which is gonna be a crucial, the crucial feature of our phase diagram, the, the role of T prime um, seemed to have a clear thing that the opposite sign of what you would expect from the experiments was what seemed to give the most robust superconductivity. Now, Subsequently, there has been uh, sort of a, well, a recent sort of explosion of work in this problem as the, as the computational methods have improved. And all of a sudden, we can uh, now treat these 2D very difficult systems uh, in a way that we couldn't before. So there's been new approaches such as IPEPs, uh, density matrix embedding theory, et cetera. And uh, improvements to DMRG and quantum Monte Carlo, dynamical mean field theory methods, um, all of this has made progress now very rapid. And um, what we frequently like to do now is use uh, several of the methods together to uh, uh, use their complementary capabilities. Um, many of these uh, features that I just was talking about in the TJ model 
um, have now uh, been found in the Hubbard model and, and fairly well es established. And the biggest puzzling uh, feature is the superconductivity. Um, and uh, so that's still a puzzle. Okay, so, um, so we return to this uh, problem with sort of the latest DMRG techniques. And, um, and so these now are all results uh, calculated by uh, uh, Sheng Tao Zhang. And um, so here is our phase diagram. Um, the vertical axis is T prime and the horizontal axis is the doping. Okay, and um, so uh, I'll say a little bit more about this later, but um, we can associate the T prime positive with electron doped coup rates uh, and the T prime negative with the whole doped coup rates. And so in the experiments, we'd expect this negative T prime region to be the region with the big superconductivity. Um, and the, this uh, relationship between T prime uh, and the electron or whole doping is actually because of a particle hole transformation. It's not that the T prime is actually different in the materials. It's, it's we have to use a particle hole transformation. Okay, so um, in the, uh, the negative T prime region, we see the stripes that you just saw in the movie. These we'll call conventional stripes. Um, and that, that has a very broad region of the phase diagram. Okay, we found one very new type of stripes, uh, which we call W3 stripes, which I'll uh, explain in a lot more detail a little bit later on. On the positive T prime side of the system, that's where we see superconductivity. The, the slash lines are showing where we get uh, a D wave superconductivity. In the upper left lower doped region, we find that this super D wave superconductivity is coexisting with antiferromagnetism. And it has a sort of secondary um, uh, P wave uh, non zero momentum triplet pairing that's uh, purely a consequence of these other two types of order existing. As we go to higher doping, um, stripes form here also, but they don't kill off the superconductivity. And uh, so we see an interesting mixture of the stripes and superconductivity. Now, the um, main tool for mapping out this phase diagram is a, a DMRG simulation, which we call a scan, where we take a very long system and we slowly change the parameters of the model or change the filling as we go along and we, we map out the system. Um, now, the advantage of this is that, you know, if you happen to be simulating in an ordinary calculation, something where you're on the phase boundary of um, two different phases, then it's very difficult to converge because uh, you know, the, you're just on the boundary. The energy differences between these two phases could be arbitrarily small. When we do a scan, we typically go through a number of different phases. And when you're deep inside the phase, that stabilizes the calculation. And um, the boundary uh, just maps into um, a, a physical boundary. So let me show you the first of these scans. Okay, so this is a scan simulation um, varying the doping um, with the position along the lattice. And it's at T prime equals plus 0.2. So it's on this uh, line up here. Okay, and um, so uh, here we see the doping between these two uh, plots. These are just different measurements of uh, the same system. It's just one calculation. Um, the top panel shows the whole density and the spin expectation values. And we see on this upper left region, it's first of all, an antiferromagnet with just one domain. It's got a very uniform pattern of holes. And um, looking down here, this is a measurement of the superconductivity. So this is nicely superconducting. The superconducting, the coloring um, shows positive versus negative. So this is a D wave superconductivity where there's a different sign for the horizontal versus vertical. Okay, So this is just sort of a broken symmetry state with a nice superconductivity. This is the sort of thing that we would say, OK, this explains high temperature superconductivity. As we increase um, the doping, it forms uh, stripes. Um, the stripes turn on sort of abruptly, 
Um, they look similar to what we saw in the movie. Um, they, the superconductivity persists for a while and then gradually weakens. Okay, and so this is going to here where the superconductivity uh, exists for a long way. Okay, and uh, so now we have um, this uh, horizontal line here going through the negative T prime region. This is the whole doped region. Um, and most of this region, we see the conventional stripes. Um, we have a little sign of the W3 stripes appearing here. We'll see that in more detail. Um, now, the, the pairing superconductivity, this is showing essentially nothing. And this is actually when we try to encourage the pairing by actually putting on a little pairing field, a small pairing field to try to encourage it. You see a very tiny response to that uh, uh, field, but basically nothing in this region in terms of superconductivity. Okay, um, the other sort of, we can choose a vertical direction to do a scan. And um, so that's, this, this is now varying T prime. So you really see the effect of the T prime on the pairing. So here, this is going up in uh, this region at uh, uh, a doping of uh, 0.13, okay? And um, so for, and it starts with T prime positive, so it's sort of coming down. And so we're in this uniform antiferromagnetic D wave uh, phase at first, we go into stripes. Uh, the stripes exist a little while with pairing when T prime is positive. And as soon as T prime goes negative, they, they sort of die off, okay? So we're seeing a very strong effect of the T prime directly uh, causing this effect on the pairing. Okay, now we move a little bit uh, more to the right at a higher doping, an overdoped uh, system. And in this regime, we have um, stripes throughout the whole system. Okay, and they look mostly the same throughout the system. Um, but if we look at the superconductivity, the superconductivity exists within the stripes for positive T prime. Uh, at some point, it starts to fade out and it's really killed off by the negative T prime. Okay, so let's now look at some of these phases in a little bit more detail. Now, the possibility of having uniform antiferromagnetism and D wave superconductivity and a particular form of se secondary uh, triplet uh, uh, P wave superconductivity has been uh, considered in a number of cases before. Uh, and it, uh, I, uh, this, this talk is uh, sort of uh, not doing justice to all the work that others have done, but in, at least in this case, I've got some of the references. In particular, this uh, reference uh, from Donna Shang's group that came out um, uh, just this uh, last week. But uh, so here it shows some non-scan plots of uh, what's going on in the system. So we see a very uniform phase with the antiferromagnetism with the holes dope through it, very uniform D wave superconductivity, okay? And this is a measurement of the singlet pairing operator on each link. The triplet pairing operator, spin one, uh, shows this very interesting pattern. And so this shows that it has momentum pi pi uh, which alternates this. And the way to think about this is if, if you have antiferromagnetism as a broken symmetry, then you, the, the idea of singlets versus triplets doesn't exist anymore. Um, if you have a pairing operator that's trying to destroy a pair of spins, it can only say it's destroyed in sort of the up-down pattern versus the down up, only one of them will really work. And so you get this modulation that goes along that gives you this, uh, uh, this uh, um, type of uh, pattern here. And, and uh, so it has momentum pi pi, and it's purely um, the, the result of having these two primary orders uh, driving it. And we can see the relationship between these orders. This is a, a little experiment where we put on an antiferromagnetic magnetic field on the system to actually increase the antiferromagnetism even more than shown here. And um, the interesting thing is that the singlet D-wave superconductivity is hardly affected by increasing the antiferromagnetism 
and to quite large levels. The triplet superconductivity, that's just riding on top of the uh, S sub Z. So the S sub Z increases, the triplet goes in sync. And if you plot the ratio, which is on the right-hand scale, uh, sort of blown up, it's staying roughly constant. So it's really just induced from this combination. Okay. Um, so the W3 stripes, uh, as far as we know, have not been uh, noticed before, and they live in a fairly small region of the phase diagram. And they're very interesting. Um, so this, this is a plot that would show the spin pattern as well as the whole density pattern, but the spins are just zero. Um, and um, so what uh, we look at instead here is, here is the uh, nearest neighbor exchange coupling, the antiferromagnetism. And what you see are these ladder patterns living in between the holes. And this looks just like, the, like what you'd see if you just simulated a two-leg Heisenberg model, no holes at all. Um, and what, what the way to think about this is that this system is decoupled between two-leg ladders and single chain uh, stripes. And the single chain stripes um, really look much like a one-dimensional TJ model, uh, which has its own particular physics of spin charge separation. So here is a measurement of the hopping, which you see is quite strong along the chains. There's also transverse hopping, but it looks like it's just sort of like brief hopping there and back along the chains. Okay, and um, we'll see in just a minute that uh, the uh, hole, there's no sign of uh, the holes in this being associated with pairs. They're spread out as much as possible. Uh, so uh, it really looks like this uh, uh, sort of decouples these two systems. And, and the, the antiferromagnetism here, it's not showing any patterns because these two leg ladders have a, uh, essentially a spin liquid state, an RVB type state. And uh, so that's sort of the state that they're forming. And that sort of makes all the, the spin-spin correlations very short ranged. There's no pairing at all seen in this phase. Okay. So you can get a further insight into these states if you um, look at uh, uh, products, product states that are, are formed within the many particle wave function. So we can always decompose a many particle wave function as a sum of product states, but it's an exponentially large ones. It's interesting to say, well, what is the most probable one? And as far as I know, we don't know how to find, even if we have the wave function, we don't know how to find exactly the most probable one. I, I think it's probably an NP hard problem, but, uh, uh, but I, but, uh, 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 if you know differently, let me know. Um, but um, we can do sort of find high probability states with a reasonable search. Uh, the search essentially goes through each particle and finds its my, my most likely location and then locks it in that location and projects it there. You have to do this a little bit differently with when you have holes because there's fewer holes than spins. And so you have to search over all sites for the most local probable location of a hole and then project it into that spot and then search for the next hole. And then after that, we go sequentially through all, all the spins and, and find the most probable uh, location for those. So in the superconducting state with the antiferromagnetism, um, you notice that uh, these pairs here, first of all, all the holes are sort of associated with pairs. Pairs tend to be in this diagonal location, which is sort of a dynamical effect that they, uh, they also like to be near neighbor, but they're actively spinning around. And, um, and so this is the most probable configuration. We had seen that before. And um, so this is sort of a view of a superconductor. Um, I don't think there's too much significance to this uh, line of holes here. I think that's just a fluctuation. I think there's lots of similar, very high probability states. So that's up on the red dot here in our phase diagram. The next one is a conventional stripe phase down in this lower region without superconductivity. So here's these two stripes. And notice that we still have the holes locked up in pairs, um, and, but, um, but separate measurements show there's no superconductivity. So essentially, you, you don't just need to have pairs. You also have to, to have the pairs be delocalized 
uh, sort of Bose condensing. And that's the problem here. They're sort of locked in place. Okay. Then the W3 stripe phase, um, instead of pairs, it has the holes at a sort of maximum distance away. Of course, this is in a cylinder. And so the most they can be in the system is four sites away. And uh, so this is again, consistent with this, the holes on these lines looking like they just live in a TJ model with no signs of superconductivity. Steve, excuse me, uh, can yes. you start wrapping up please? Because we were yes. uh, over the time already just- uh, Yes, sorry yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry, and I, I haven't been able to keep track of time with the whole screen taking up everything. So That's why just, we're here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so um, just to uh, give a quick comparison with the cuprates, um, here's a, a sort of more detailed phase diagram of a sort of typical cuprate. And we see this sort of antiferromagnetism, CO is charge order, of uh, course, which we would interpret as stripes and the superconductivity. Okay, and we look at our results in the phase diagram reinterpreting the T prime positive and T prime negative as being electron doped and hole doped cuprates. And you see very many, you see similarities. This is width eight and width six. The, the big green sort of higher uh, region of, super, of antiferromagnetism is sort of shown here. There's many features that are very similar in these. The thing that's very much not the same is the superconductivity. The model gives the opposite uh, prediction for hold up versus electron superconductivity. Okay. So, so to conclude, um, the tensor network uh, simulations have, have improved enough to resolve um, the phase diagrams of, of a number of 2D strongly correlated model systems, and, and this is continuing. Um, and we have a determined an approximate phase diagram of this T, T prime J model, um, finding that uh, the finite size effects seem to be rather small for the width of the system. And so we think of this applies to 2D. Um, and it gives a qualitative description of a number of features of the cuprates, but it fails in terms of the superconductivity. And how to fix the model is still a very open question. Okay, thank you.